Hello, rock stars, and welcome to another edition of Short Stories with S.E. Rocks. Today we're going to continue the Tony Schiavone story, Butts in Seats. I'm going to start at Chapter 2. Let's begin. Chapter 2, An Unexpected Dinner. In 1980, I graduated from James Madison University with a major in radio TV film. While I was in college, I got a job at the local radio station, WTON. I was working for Al Charles, the man to whom I owe my entire career. Al, the owner of the station, knew I was a hard-working and well-liked, and, as such he told me, as soon as you graduate, we'll have a full-time job for you. And sure enough, the week after I graduated, I started my job there as the nighttime disc jockey on the 6 p.m. to midnight shift. That was still the one by Orleans and The Biggest Party of Me by Ambrosia. Next up is Take It Easy on Me by Little River Band. What was especially enticing, though, was that I got to do the football play-by-play for the local team and basketball games, too. I had largely fallen away from watching professional wrestling at that point, but I would still often stand in front of the mirror and pretend to hold the stick and interview professional wrestlers. It was a fun dream, but never something I could make a living doing, right? Four months later, a tape of my football and baseball play-by-play work landed a call from WKEW in Greensboro, North Carolina. They wanted me to be the announcer for the Greensboro Hornets baseball team. You're the man for the job! The Hornets were the Class A team for the New York Yankees. If I took the job working for them, I could perhaps, in time, get a job announcing for the Yankees. Although Al tried his best to keep me at WTON upon learning I accepted the job at WKEW, I packed up my Toyota Corolla and moved to Greensboro. This was in March of 1981, and it was, and remains, one of the greatest years of my life. As I walked into the radio station, I thought to myself about how I was beginning my dream of being on my way to announcing for Major League Baseball. Something else happened that day that changed my life forever, though. That was the day I met the one true love of my life. This is Lois Berger, our office manager and receptionist. I looked at her and thought to myself, whoa, that is one good-looking woman. And when I saw this little guy, I felt a little sorry for him. He reminded me of my younger brothers, and all I could think was that these city shysters had dragged this poor country boy out of here all alone. She says that because she's six years older than me, It's only five and a half years! The more Lois and I got to talking, the more we learned we had a lot in common, including going to the same school for colleges, although at different times. Hey, I'm going to tell this part since you're sure to just lie to them about it. Tony had only been there for one day when he more or less invited himself over for dinner. It was the same day President Reagan was shot. I looked down at him and he looked like a little lost Boy Scout sitting there cross-legged on the floor. And all I could think to myself was that this poor boy could use a good meal. Knock, knock, knock. I got home and changed into jeans and a t-shirt, totally casual. It's just dinner. No big deal, right? Once he got there and I opened the door, though, oh... Well, let's just say I realized we didn't have the same idea about what kind of dinner it was going to be. Back then, I pretty much lived on a carton of cigarettes and a case of beer a week, but I splurged and made him my famous fried chicken, which is to die for, I might add. Actually, it was steak and broccoli. It was not! It was fried chicken! Anyway, the following Monday was my birthday, and I had taken the day off, so Tony sent me flowers and asked me if I wanted to drive with him back to Craigsville. He had to go back to get some of his things from home. But as it turns out, it was also a way for him to introduce me to his mother and her side of the family. Driving back that night, I remember looking at him. Gosh, I can see him like I'm there now. We were passing through Martinsville, and I was looking at him. His arms. He had very sexy arms. His profile. And I just knew. I just knew. You said something that was very foolish to me that night. Do you remember what it was? No. You said to me, I cannot imagine having a family with anyone but a guy like you. I said that? You did. Well, it's true. And it's still true. Why don't you take over again from here? Gladly. Three days later, on April 9th, the opening day of baseball season, I proposed to Lois. If I lost you, it would be too great of a loss. Will you marry me? 
When I announced my engagement to Lois at work, the news was not taken well. We were told that there was a no fraternizing clause in the station rules and regulations. Apparently everyone at this radio station felt that Lois was some sort of black widow who had gotten her clutches into me. But honestly, I think it was just motivated by a lot of jealousy since almost everyone else in the office was interested in her. Since they had so much money tied up in me, they gave her a two-week notice of her termination so she could train her replacement. I considered quitting, but Lois convinced me to hang in there. Looking back, that's kind of the story of my whole life. Just hang in there. June 6, 1981, two months after her birthday, I married the most educated, best-looking woman I had ever met in my entire life. Our friends and family were there, as was most of the baseball team, but no one from the radio station attended the wedding. We later learned that they were told they'd be fired if they showed up. Things eventually got back to normal at the radio station, and I stayed there until February 1992, when I got a very interesting phone call from Charlotte, North Carolina. Is this Tony Schiavone? And that was Chapter 2 from Tony Schiavone, Butts and Seats. I hope you enjoyed this chapter. Be on the lookout for the next, and remember to keep rocking and stay true.